Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week, you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and Help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Now, the silly travel at my day job continues. Uh, last week was Princeton and New York City in a back-to-back um, workshop and press event. This week, it's off to French Lake, Indiana for a client's executive retreat. Um, they want me to give a presentation and do some Q&A, which I've gotten alarmingly better at over the last couple of years of this job. Um, I'll let you know if I get any pics of Larry Bird's birthplace. Otherwise, I will be at the uh, the French Lick Resort. We'll be flying into Louisville, of course. Um, okay, I didn't know that, but when we were trying to figure out how to get there from Newark, they said Louisville. Anyway, um, it is yet another trip for me. Uh, it should be paring down in the next few weeks for a while and then uh, picking back up again in May, but it's not like you guys care. The upshot is, um, this week's guest did an awful lot of traveling for, for her new book. She's Sarah Williams Goldhagen, the author of Welcome to Your World, How the Built Environment Shapes Our Lives. It's from Harper Press. Now, Welcome to Your World is an amazing book. It's about how our, our buildings, our, our homes, our offices, our schools, our hospitals tend to be built without consideration for people. and Sarah starts from an architectural and design perspective, but then she brings in all these these new advances in cognitive neuroscience and psychology to explore how well how the built environment can be improved and can raise our quality of life and how it doesn't have to be a massive business expense. It's something that makes sense uh, in, in a way. It's a really amazing book. It's not about giant statement buildings uh or the whole star architect thing it's it's much more about the smaller scale world and paying attention to the details in in again those those sorts of buildings i was talking about at the beginning um and the way they can the way they do damage our lives in a lot of respects and the way they can be improved so she she calls for this like well what they say in the book human centric design it's it's based on principles about how the mind really works um she also kind of blows up the mind body schism uh in in the book and and shows that we're actually part of a mind body environment triad uh which to me makes the book even more fascinating uh, although it does involve a couple of really creepy illustrations of what human sensory and motor systems really accentuate we'll get into those during the podcast um the thing about welcome to your world is it's a really beautiful book it is filled with photography uh, of examples of really good architecture and design, um, as well as some negative ones. She's not um, just doing the rah-rah thing. She actually shows things that don't work and why they don't work and what should be in their place. I learned an awful lot from this book. People have known me for a, a long time, know that I used to write about, um, in a snarky way, architecture, uh, the whole architect thing, um, issues about um, making a splash through big buildings, but not really taking account of the, the little stuff. Um, so this book is a, a great corrector for that, and it's sort of a pairing with the episode I did with Vitold Rybczynski uh, about two years ago. You can look that one up. It's episode like 115 or so, um, and he's a great architect, writer, and, and, and a p- former architect. That um, th- that one complements this one really well. I actually listened to it on the drive into New York to, to record with Sarah. 
The other thing about Welcome to Your World, uh, in terms of talking about how architecture can be really damaging to the human psyche, is that it really reminded me a lot of one of my favorite comic books from the 80s, uh, which is called Mr. X. It came from Vortex Press. Uh, we talk about that during the conversation. I won't go into it here, except to say it's a science fiction comic about a city that um, was poorly designed and is driving its inhabitants insane. Uh, I have to send a copy of it now to Sarah, who was absolutely thrilled to find out that someone had been writing about this sort of stuff in an entertainment context, God, 30 years ago. Anyway, Welcome to Your World is a fantastic book, and I was really happy to get together with Sarah to record uh, a conversation about it. Um, I was also really happy that she had the book coming out because I wanted an excuse to go visit her home. Um, I'd previously recorded there with her husband, Daniel Goldhagen, and um, that's where I learned that they live in a converted church in East Harlem. It's an amazing, amazing home, uh, and I was really looking forward to, to going back there. There's a pic or two of it on our Instagram feed if you want to check that out. It's Instagram.com slash VMSpod. Here's Sarah's bio from the flap copy for Welcome to Your World. There's a more extensive first-person bio at her website, uh, sarahwilliamsgoldhagen.com, and I'll spell that out for you at the end of the show. Sarah Williams Goldhagen taught at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design for 10 years and was the New Republic's architecture critic until recently. Currently a contributing editor at Art in America and Architectural Record, she is an award-winning writer who has written about buildings, cities, and landscapes for many national and international publications, including the New York Times, the American Prospect, and Harvard Design Magazine. She lives in New York City. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Sarah Williams Goldhagen. So where does the book come from? What's the origin of the book? Um, I know the preface. I know the the story of teenage you and Florence, but right. What was the uh, well, the, there, the flashpoint for it? The flashpoint for the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always known, as I say in the preface to the book, that the built environment has these profound effects on us, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to explain those effects. Um, so I got a PhD in art history initially and, and loved art history and enjoyed doing that kind of work. But after about seven or eight years of doing that kind of work, I realized, you know what, I'm just not getting there yet. I'm not explaining the things that I really need to explain mm. that, um, that I think that people can't articulate very well. Uh, and then the second part of that, so it was partly coming out of an art historical background and then reflecting upon the kinds of questions that I was asking and answering and realizing that I, they needed to be changed, um, was teaching in architecture schools in which um, I found that whenever the subject of the user's experience of a building or a design or whatever came up, uh, either very quickly or after a little while, the conversation turned into, oh, but this is way too subjective and we can't really articulate what those experiences are anyway. All we can do is try to create a good design and so on and so forth. And um, so I listened on crits, which are these juries in which you, you review students' work with a bunch of other people. I listened to these conversations over and over again, and I thought, well, there are some things that we know about how people experience their built environments. And, um, and then the third thing that, well, two other things. The third thing was that... Um, an agent wrote me and said, have you ever thought about writing a book for the general audience? And I thought, oh, that sounds like a really cool idea. Yeah. Uh, and then I started reading. Just I became interested by readings in the popular press and then later books and so on in all this cognitive neuroscience um, and um, in these, these funny these studies that were showing really interesting and unexpected things, not just by cognitive neuroscientists. For example, 
Uh, there's one of my favorites is called the clipboard study, where uh, they took a group of people and they said, you're going to interview someone else. And so they put them in a room and they gave each person a clipboard. And some of the clipboards were very heavy and some of the clipboards were very light. And so the subjects did what they were supposed to do and very dutifully interviewed these subjects and so on. And then they were given a questionnaire at the end. They had to score the supposed job candidates on a variety of qualities and dimensions, including gravitas. Mm -hmm. And um, the people who had the heavier clipboards scored the people they were interviewing as more intellectually weighty when they were holding a heavy clipboard. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that is so cool. And it, it just sparked this idea that everywhere in our environment, we're getting these kinds of what, are, what psychologists call primes all the time. And how is that working? That's, that's how people are experiencing things. Um, so that that's the long answer to the foundation of the book. <laughs> but a lifetime of study leading up to it. Absolutely. In fact, where was the, where did architecture originate for you in your history? You mentioned art <clears throat> history and all mm -hmm. that, but, but how did that seg into an interest in, in the built environment? Um, my father was a, a lawyer uh, and a scholar of law and urban planning. So he taught urban planning in the law school at Rutgers University and law in the urban planning department <laughs> at Rutgers. And my mother was always interested in historic preservation. Mm -hmm. And the result of those two things was that a, a couple of things. One, we traveled, and I was taken to unusual places, different from the places that everybody I knew when they traveled went. You know, when we, we did go to Paris, but for example... But not Disney World. But not yeah. Disney World. Yeah. I did go there once. But <laughs> um, one early trip, I remember, we went to Sweden to see the Swedish new towns that are satellite developments outside of Sweden because this was a model of urban growth that my father was really interested in. So I had friends who were going to the French Riviera and doing this and that, and we went to see Swedish new towns. Um, and the other thing that came out of my father's work, because my father's work was quite political and, in fact, progressive um, politically, uh, was the idea and the knowledge that Politics and the social world are infuse the built environment. The built mm -hmm. environment is not inert. Yeah. Um, it's an active agent in the shaping of people's lives. And so well, those in a, two in things. In a master way, when you see, uh, um, for me it was reading The Power Broker. Yes. Uh, and, and realizing right. that New York wasn't like this. And one guy sort of built the parameters yep. for what this city is, or mm -hmm. what Manhattan is and what uh, the, the other boroughs are. Mm -hmm. um, that sense that, you know, it didn't, A, it didn't have to be like this. B, that, you know, with the right political lever, you can... You can um, make things happen or yes. change them or... Yes, make absolutely. them for the worse, as, as it turns right. out. Why are our built environments terrible? Why are uh, in general, our built yes. environments terrible? Yeah. Uh, you bring up a bunch of terrible, or at least uh, terrible effects of our, our built environment on our lives. Can you, can you sort of characterize that? Yes, I try that? to be kind in the way. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you <laughs> but, also bring up some great ones. No, you know, but the, there, the are, there are, ones. I mean, most of our built environments are terrible. Yeah. Um, Again, you're talking and, about to a guy from northern New Jersey, so. Yeah, you know, right. I yeah. mean, um, they're, they're terrible. And the, the thing about the built environment is if it's not helping you, it's, it's probably doing something bad. There aren't, there is no such thing as a neutral built environment, which is the way I think a lot of people think of it right now. They think, uh, you know, if I just kind of throw this up, it's not, it's not going to do any harm yeah. to people, but, but in fact it does. Okay. The reasons why. Um, I think the principal reason why is because, well, there, again, it's a multi, multi-step answer. Yeah. Um, but you're good at those. Yeah, I'm good at those, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh, the market, particularly in the United States, has determined that materials has sort of 
put the construction industry and the materials that they use to the lowest common denominator because people uh, have, because cost is at a premium and uh, so these materials are very cheaply constructed and used, and people don't really think it, re it matters all that much if you, as long as you give sort of the icons of a good house or, you know, a good public building or whatever. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that it's, there is a self-perpetuating quality to the nature of the built environment, which is that psychologically people habituate to the environments that they have. Uh, and in the United States, for most of the United States, the built environments are really poor, but they are familiar mm -hmm. to people. And, um, and people tend to place a higher premium on things that they are familiar with. Um, and so they don't ask for better design, and they don't get it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the marketplace, and then there's partly what I implied in my... Uh, first answer, which is that designers are not given sufficient training in the principles of environmental psychology and um, how people actually are aware of and experience these things. So it's a little hit or miss. I mean, sometimes they intuit the right things and they get it right, and sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think there's uh, enough of a science behind it? at this point, to, not to standardize, but at least to, to build and design to better features? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of science behind this. Without, and this is my, my catch-22 aspect of it, without it becoming gamed. What without do you mean? building, well, we scored X number of you know human design points. Now mm -hmm. we can we hit whatever that minimum is. There's, there's always a sense of like with lead certification. Yes, that, you know, right. Well, if we just tweak this, this, and this, we'll score the right number of points, uh -huh. and then the building will get a nice certification, even though we've actually made it less efficient or done you know something worse to, right. to get to that point. Right. Is there a sense of of trade off in that respect, or is it really? I don't think so, yeah. um, because. No, I can't, I can't think of any way that it does because if you use better materials, they're going to last longer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if it's part of a checklist, then it's part of a checklist. And by better materials, I mean, um, you know, just take the, take the example of wood. Um, you know, put a slab of wood next to you and then put a slab of plywood with wood veneer on the top or even with vinyl that has a wood grain. Yeah that represents a good grain on it. Okay, even if you have the best vinyl covering over that particle board so that it really looks like wood, it doesn't have any of the acoustic properties of wood, it doesn't have any of the tactile properties of wood, and, it, and, and I would say it probably doesn't have much of the associative qualities of wood either because when our memories associate by pulling together our sensory experiences of a lot of different things, which include the tactile qualities, the, the auditory qualities, the acoustic qualities, and so on. Um, so um, if the worst possible case scenario were that this resulted in, in a, a lead-type thing where you had a checklist and... Um, you'd still get better buildings and better a better built environment. Mm -hmm. Are you more interested in what works or what doesn't work? I'm interested in both. Yeah, in um, terms of the why underneath both of them. Absolutely, but, yeah. because if you you can't actually articulate what works until you figured out why things aren't working, mm -hmm. and so it's really a continuum, and it's part of the same question. I mean, when I became an architecture critic and I decided that I was going to stop teaching architecture students and become a critic instead, one of the first things that I kept saying to myself over and over again was, you have to articulate a position on what you think good design is. I think, a, I think it's in all forms of criticisms, people sometimes just don't do that. They sort of do a thumbs up, thumbs down, oh, I like it, I don't. And I thought, no, I really need a very well-considered position. So, so that had me looking at everything mm -hmm. and analyzing. Yeah, I'd, I'd wondered, because um, I interviewed Vitold Rybczynski about yep. two years ago, and 
a, I'm a big fan of his. Well, yeah, he, he had a line in there about how there is no theory of architecture. It either works or it doesn't, mm. which I assume from the inside makes sense to me. As an outsider, it was there's probably something problematic about that statement, but mm-hmm. you know, I can't quite place it. And a, um, the challenge of being an architect, architecture critic mm-hmm. as to... Um, it's not the same as being a theater critic. It's not like they're going to take the building down if you write a, a negative Correct. review of it in the Wall Street Journal and put up another one next season. Yeah. Um, what do you see that that role as a critic? Uh, I mean, how do you see that differing from, you know, again, criticism of even a, a consumer product design, which you know can be changed sure. on, on the fly? Uh, what really goes into to critiquing something that needs that, that sense of time mm-hmm. behind it? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and there are a couple of things. I'll, first, I'll make it an even more complicated situation, okay. which is that uh, some critics, uh, partly by virtue of the function of the publications I was writing for, but um, some critics, particularly daily critics or critics that work for daily mm-hmm. newspapers and so on, will write articles and critique projects in the process of their being designed in the hopes that that influences either the client or the architect or so on, too to change the design. And I decided very early on I was not going to do that, that I was going to write about things that were in the world, Mm -hmm. not ideas. Um, And I mean, they are ideas, but not just ideas. I would say concrete ones. They're concrete, concretized ideas, exactly. So finished buildings. So your question is very pertinent, which is um, why write about a building when it's already finished? The most obvious answer is it raises public awareness. I mean, people are not, most people are simply not sufficiently aware of how profoundly their environments affect them. Um, And so any way that you can catch their interest and think, oh, wait a minute, this this street bench really matters. Mm -hmm. It matters how it looks and how it's designed. That's a good thing. Okay, so that's the first level. The second level is, of course, you do want to influence how a particular set of designs or design orientation um, is valued. So there are some, for example, when I first started working on the book, and it's still true, but to a lesser extent, Architects were really, really entranced, for very good reasons, with uh, parametric technology, the technology that allows them to do, to input into a computer, to draw on the computer, and then input into the computer sort of different ideas, and the computer will immediately spit up these images of what it will look like if you do that, what it will look yeah. like if you do this, and so on. And um, what ended up happening early on was you got a lot of buildings that look like computer simulations right. um, that were really not good. Yeah. And I mean, but or on even... On the screen, they were great. Right. On the, on the screen, they look great. As drawings, they look great. As renderings, which are very deceptive, uh, because you can now simulate on a computer exactly, almost exactly what a building is going to look like in the context. And people often think they're looking at real buildings when they're yeah. not. Um, and, and but it they didn't model work. The, uh, the, the death ray phenomenon from that building in London that, that reflects the sun yes, right exactly. down on the car in front of it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, you get the environment, but not the totality of mm-hmm. it all. So. Now that you've seen the Calatrava thing down at. at <laughs> <laughs> because you'd written about it about 10 years ago when this was being designed. Correct. Um, you, worse than you imagined? Um, no, just about as bad okay. <laughs> as I imagined. I mean, I saw his work in Valencia, which yeah. is, uh, he's been sort of doing uh-huh. the same thing um, all along. Uh, you, you know, the Calatrava Oculus thing, whatever, it, I think that's what it's called, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um you know, it exemplifies an imagistic approach to design. You know, this sort of highly theatrical approach to design that when you're actually moving through the square outside of it, it's really pretty unpleasant to be around because it's 
has sharp edges. It looms above you in this kind of slightly menacing sort of way. Uh, it's it's completely out of proportion to everything else in the plaza. So it just feel you feels like it's squeezing into every available space. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then from the inside, it just, uh, to me, I feel like I'm inside a rib cage. I mean, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew uh, that was an experience that, that exactly. you, know, you had to have in New York? Right. Well, exactly. Yeah, it's one of the weird things. My first trip to Chicago about mm -hmm. 15, almost 20 years ago, uh, this New York is the model of a city for me, having lived 25 miles from it and seeing it from a, a big hill outside yep. on the, the edge of our town uh, all those years. The first time I went to Chicago, there was the experience of, oh, you can have really tall buildings that don't feel like they're yeah. crushing down on you, that actually sweep right. back from the, the street a little bit and yeah. somehow come off as more welcoming. And literally, that was the first time I had that moment of, okay, maybe the New York paradigm, which right. I subsequently read the Rem Koolhaas delirious New mm -hmm. York thing with the, the idea that the building code sort of dictated right. the structure and, and the, the, the setbacks, et cetera. Uh, but that sense that you can have skyscrapers that aren't... Um, Imposing that aren't menacing you necessarily. They're not, they can be imposing, but they're not menacing, yeah. and they don't and they don't block all the light because they are widely spaced. They do have these bases, and then they come up, um, and they and they just they become a sort of a nice background. You have to, I mean, the experience of walking down a street in you know any major street in Chicago and walking down, you know, even. Madison or Third Avenue in the fifties, yeah. you know, is in totally different. Mm -hmm. What would you change about New York? Oh dear, about Manhattan in particular, given the the history with urban planning and the, the family, uh -huh. et cetera, um, which I assume overlapped with uh, Jane Jacobs' era. Um, Absolutely, yeah. it did. Yes, although what, my uh, father was even a little older than that. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So she, he was, he was one of the urban planners that she was criticizing. Okay. <laughs> But he said, no, I'm sort of on your side. It's okay. Yeah, right. Was there actually a, for your father, was there a development or realization of the impact of some, were there theories that he had that he subsequently realized, this is actually really bad for human existence. This made sense from yes. a, a theoretical perspective. Of course. I mean, yeah. he grew with the times. And I mean, the critique that he always had of, of Jane Jacobs is that um, is that her model was too based on something that was really particular and local, which was Greenwich Village yeah. and her experience in Greenwich and that's Village. Where the prescriptive chapter at the end of the book is is where it fails. It right, apart it me, doesn't but, work. Yeah, yeah. and um, and he was he was right about that. But of course, in the towers in the park, uh, in the critique of the towers in the park and the kind of lack of ornamentation and the value to historic buildings that Jane Jacobs either argued or or practiced in, in as an activist uh my father totally came around i mean he wrote a book on historic preservation late in his life and so on so yeah he grew you mentioned writing for a general audience mm -hmm. what do you want the general audience to take from the book the the general audience that isn't involved in policy necessarily sure. that isn't a decision maker. What do you want them to to do or to see based on Welcome to Your World? Well, one answer is that we're humans who live in bodies, and the built environment is our habitat. And just as other animals rely on, modify, and thrive from the habitats that they inhabit and create, uh, we do too. We're just as as reliant on our environments as any other animal is. Um, so that's one thing. And that design, the design of those habitats is really critical and can be bad and can harm you or can be good and help you. Uh, so that's the largest that's the largest thing I want the public to take away. But another thing, I'll, I'll tell the story in a slightly different way. I was giving a lecture in Arkansas at a museum once and arguing about what makes a good building and so on and so forth. And so at the end of the lecture, someone got up and said, you know, they're building a post office, 
a new post office in my town. And it's a public building, so of course it has to be functional and really economical. And what does high design have to say about that? And it's an entirely reasonable question because we do currently bifurcate the environment into high design and everything else yeah. and building. And he was saying, look, the public taxpayers are paying for this building. It's an everything else building. Uh, and that yeah. is simply, I mean, what the research shows is that's a fallacious distinction. Uh, it's all architecture, and it all needs to be as well designed as you could possibly make it. Now, at, and at any level of investment, you can make a better building or a worse building. Um, you can build badly or well. Yeah, what has changed in design in the, the time you've been teaching and the way the public has approached it, the way product design has improved? Obviously, Apple is sort of the right. seen as the... the paradigm for a great design until mm -hmm. recent years but um. well that's a really interesting question because an apple is a good model because one of the things that is so smart about the apple products which i with my limited knowledge understand because that's what people tell me that they're not actually that good computers is that they're designed <clears throat> for exactly the kinds of human cognitive needs Mm -hmm. that I lay out in the book. Uh, the way we think is mostly non-conscious, very associative, um, and we use, uh, and concrete. I mean, you need to, concrete things. For example, the folder icon on our computer isn't, isn't a folder, but we need something to visualize and to, to mentally simulate a container in which we put our things because that's the way we live our lives in the real world. Yeah, in the old days, in the operating system, I guess back in the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, back when you had floppy disks and mm -hmm. such, if you wanted the disk back, you had to drag the disk icon into the trash, which is counterintuitive to me because right. at that point you're throwing it out. You're not taking it back. But, uh, you know, they apparently got over that and, and you yes. know, had it turn into a little ejection button. And, exactly. and now, of course, everything is right. streamed and we don't have to worry about physical media ever mm -hmm. again. Um, but I do wonder about that in terms of how, uh, let's see, how much more aware we've become of design well, uh, from a general populist perspective. Yeah, that's the implication is yeah. that um, be, because of Apple, because of very good product designers, in fact, are, are way ahead in terms of figuring these things out than other sorts of designers. Maybe way ahead, maybe a, a little bit of an exaggeration, but uh, they... People now under, do understand, because of well-designed mega hits like Apple, that design matters. That's why they're willing to buy Apple computers, even though they're much more expensive than Windows computers, or you know, and the operating systems are weaker, and so on and so forth. Because intuitively, which is how we act, and emotionally, which is how we perceive a lot of stuff, uh, they they're easier to use. And the cool and factor. more comfortable, and they're cool. Yes, the cool factor is is still a yes, big part of, of absolutely who we are. Ask my kids. <laughs> I, I was one of those geeks too. Uh -huh. So, um, one of the well, one of the things that the whole book is built around, as you mentioned, is that the advances in cognitive neuroscience that create a greater understanding of what human beings actually do and are uh -huh. in, in their world. How much? Um, how difficult was that for you to learn? You know, how, how much of that is the layman's <laughs> vibe versus the, wow, this is really beyond my field. Can you boil this down for me and I could figure out if it fits my theory? Uh -huh. You know, how much of a, a learning curve was that for you? A huge yeah. learning curve. I mean, I come from a humanities background mm -hmm. and I have a PhD in art history. Um, and, you know, I knew a little bit about science, but it was so clearly the right way to go. Mm. And so the book took um, seven years, uh, and four or five of those years, I was just reading psychological studies yeah. um, over and over and pouring over them, trying to evaluate, trying to evaluate, you know, whether they were reliable, not reliable, which, of course, 
was mostly out of my expertise area, um, and um, and pulling also from a lot of different fields, not just cognitive neuroscience, but environmental psychology, this um, sort of orientation called embodied cognition, which shows that the way we think is really profoundly shaped and anchored in the fact that we live in bodies and environments in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, the learning curve was steep. I assumed just because <laughs> everything you, you portrayed in terms of art history, the, the mm-hmm. literary references you make throughout, those right. things all sort of you know fit a general continuum. But mm-hmm. you know, it, it would seem that that would take a little more um, work or consultation. Did you have a, a translator of sorts? Anyone you could say is this? I, I had a lot of okay. different translators, yeah. um, and you know, I was asking questions to people all the time. I found people everywhere. I went to conferences. I, you know, I would say, "What do you think of this? What do you yeah. think of that?" So, uh, yeah. And one of the things that's been really most gratifying for me so far, of course, the book is not even published yet, is that scientists love it. Yeah, what's the advance reception been like? Great. I do want to note that the blurb on the back cover comes from a person at the Salk Institute, for which you have the most glowing descriptions of their actual environment and, and building. So I wasn't sure if there was a little, oh, she wrote such nice things about our No, our- that wasn't <laughs> it. No, no, no. The way that happened was that uh, there was a conference by this little organization called the Academy for Neuroscience and Architecture. Mm-hmm. And it's held every year at the Salk Institute. Um, and I, I was asked to give a paper there. And my first book was about the architect of the Salk Institute, Louis Kahn. And so I thought, well, it just makes sense for me to take these principles that I'm working on and apply them to an analysis of the Salk Institute. So I, which of course is a pretty high risk strategy given that you are sitting there in an audience of people who work at the Salk yeah, Institute. I've never noticed that before. And yeah. architects who yeah. live and teach the Salk Institute every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went out there, I worked and worked and worked on this presentation and I gave it. Um, and I, it turned out that Terry, Terry Sanowski, was sitting next to me, and um, the minute I sat down, he said, that was incredible. I have never thought of most of what you said about that building, and it makes perfect sense. Of course, the human perceptual qualities are the way that this was designed. Mm -hmm. And so so he and I stayed in touch. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then when when it was time to send the book out for blurbs, I mean, he gave me this great blurb. Nice. So. Well, let me ask you, along those lines, we talked about my um, bizarre education before we started uh-huh. recording. Um, how important do you think your liberal arts and humanities background is to coming up with this as a um, – or being able to to see the world like this? Oh, uh, instead critical. Of if you were coming from the neuropsych thing where you could understand some of the principles behind uh-huh. it, but not necessarily right. the aesthetic. I mean, look, I've been looking at buildings almost all of my, my sentient, cognizant life and analyzing and thinking about them and so on. And um, the book is heavily based in the science, but of course, science, scientists work on very small controlled, discrete problems and advance small, controlled, discrete conclusions and or hypotheses as they go out there or findings. And um, I realized that the built environment needed a bigger picture. It needed the kind of broad-based, wait a minute, The way that we are thinking about the built environment, the way that we're placing value, not placing value on it, the way that we understand how people experience these environments, it's all wrong Mm -hmm. um, and needs to be changed. Now, I don't think that that's a that's a kind of humanities liberal arts approach because it's big, it's broad rushed, it's true. Uh, but I think if I were trained as a scientist, I'm not sure I would have ended up going there. Mm-hmm. And your family history and policy being the third leg? Absolutely. Of yes, okay. of course. Yes. Do you have any hope for uh, um, 
the sort of infrastructure deal that would be promoted by the uh, administrator or the executive branch of our, our government right now. <laughs> you mean hope that it's going to happen? Um, or possibilities of, oh, wow, if we actually invested in infrastructure, these are some things that could be done as opposed to the mm -hmm. lowest common denominator sort of buildings. No. Yeah. Sorry. I will say, before, long before he was elected, um, our current president did talk about why his buildings are so incredibly boring on the outside. Oh, did he? Yeah. yeah. I remember reading say? him years ago. He said, in his typical tone, I could hire fancy architects and come up with groundbreaking avant-garde designs, and then the zoning guys and the environmental people are just going to strip it all down to nothing anyway. So why don't I just go with a big cylinder and do all the, the nice stuff on the inside? Well, that's not really true, but I know. But yeah. you know that that seems but to be the course, justification. It's a good excuse. Yeah, it's yeah. one of those like, ah, may as well just put up another right. tower, and we'll you know put lots of gold and everything on the inside. Right. So right. Because um, yeah, uh, and that was in terms of talking about the um, again the 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 money aspect of things, the the policy and zoning mm -hmm. aspect, as well as environmental. Um, what we have to overcome to to start to um, realize some of the things that you're proposing in the book. Mm -hmm. um, Right. It's a, it's a heavy lift, yeah. but it's an important one. And if people realize, you know, that their kids can learn better if the school that their kids are sitting in is better designed, yeah. that their mother can heal more quickly from a, an operation if she's in a hospital room that's better designed. If people begin to realize the ways that these influ these these environments are influencing our health and our emotional states and so on and so forth, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe we can get there. Do you see yourself speaking on a, a policy basis about this as opposed to the, the, the scientists, uh -huh. the, uh, you know, the reading crowd? Well, I'm not a policy wonk. I, oh, mean, I and, just told you, neither yeah. am I, and somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can, I could speak about the, I can yeah. speak about the general policy issues because mm -hmm. they cut across all levels of government. Uh, the fact is that, you know, municipal codes are important and sometimes they enforce really bad design. So it's at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level um, that that uh, the orientation has to change. Well, if I start freelancing as a lobbyist, I'll, I'll get you into it. Please. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love that. Now, um, the whole Starkitecture mm -hmm. vibe. Uh, or or wave, I guess, as we know it. Um, it seems from the book that you're less concerned about giant statement buildings and much more about the the the, the smaller dated again the the the, the schoolhouses, the, yes. the the hospitals, et cetera. Do you feel the whole star architect thing kind of draws attention away from good design and architecture in terms of these giant statements, or do, well, do you see it having an impact one way or the other? It, it does exactly what you said. It draws attention away from mm -hmm. the importance of the rest of the built environment, uh, and it also reinforces people's public, the public's perception that design is something they can't afford. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so it's a really pernicious and also, unfortunately, a self-perpetuating system because that's the way that by these big statement buildings that look good in photographs, even if they're not that great to be in, that's how architects get attract new clients and developers and so on. Have you ever gotten into any spats with a uh, uh, star architects you've written about? Um, Did Liebeskind have a thing against you, or is there anything? No, uh, <laughs> no. I, my understanding is that Frank Gehry has a little bit of a thing <laughs> about me because I have criticized his work. As have I, but I have to say the, the, the Ripchinsky book that I read uh, to record with him, the um Was that uh, the humanist, chair book? The, or? Uh, the, oh, humanist, the Humanist Toolkit. Yeah, he actually redeems Gehry for me somewhat, but in terms of the small-scale buildings, like the houses that he's done. Oh, those are beautiful. Yeah, that was my moment Great. of, oh, okay, so he's not... Hey, curved metal. Let's do it again. Right. You know, the, the, the same. <laughs> right. I think we mentioned the Cooper Union one when I was talking to him. That, that oh, one. yeah. <laughs> you know, that, a that's terrible right. building. Those, those a reactions. terrible building that doesn't work at all. And managed to bankrupt a college. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Real triple whammy. Right. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, you you find it in general that it's. I mean, from talking to to Rybczynski, it was the idea that you know once upon a time there were big name architects, but there wasn't a media culture of celebrity around it. We we're trying to figure out what led to that outside of 
it's a building, you know, it's, it's big and there should be a story behind it. And the man mm-hmm. behind it, usually a man, uh, should, should be right. celebrated. Right. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's partly because the buildings are big. The internet and globalization has, is really the underpinnings of this architecture system because these bil- these, we, Ada Louise Huxtable called them helicopter architects. Uh, you know, they just basically jet from this place to that and design their buildings um, quite no frequently of the, the, of the local the, culture, yeah. traditions, or and, and some of them without a real grasp of human sensory experience and perception and the kinds of things that people actually need in the buildings that they use. You're saying they're emotionally places. stunted and, and not really no, human. No, I'm not I'm saying st- that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. Although, if you've been, I think you mentioned it, uh, to Liebeskin's, uh the Jewish Museum in, right. in Copenhagen, uh, which in was, Copenhagen or in Berlin? No, there's uh, one in Copenhagen that I think he did that was like the Museum of Dr. Caligari. Oh, it's, I it's, haven't been there, oh, but I can only imagine jagged and uh-huh. right. Yeah, um, which I guess was meant to serve some sort of purpose. I just can't figure out exactly what it was. Um, no. but, but anyway, that's, mm-hmm. that's, yeah. Right. The nice thing about being me is that I can just be snarky and not have to worry about any long-term ramifications. Oh, I'm plenty <laughs> snarky. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. Now, let me ask, this is going to be probably the most obscure reference I make in this entire yes. conversation. There was a comic book back in the 1980s and 1990s, a science fiction book called Mr. X that was about a, um, a city that was supposed to be perfectly designed. It's called Radiant City. Um, it's supposed to be perfectly designed and uh, because they used shoddy um, workmanship and mm-hmm. cut corners on the design, it was driving its own inhabitants insane. I love this. You never okay because I will I get you. I'll get you a big the, anthology need, of this stuff because I, I figured. Need this. Yeah, basically the the original architect was uh, he comes back and, and um, he's trying to fix the city and, mm-hmm. and bring it back, but people are just flinging themselves off of uh, uh, balconies <laughs> That's and stuff. Great. It's a beautiful I wish Art I knew Deco city it. too. Oh, it, it's reading it. I was like, you know, I kind of doubt she's going to have any idea what Mister X is, but you know, it, it sort of fit the vibe for this entire thing in a very simplified. That's great way, but yeah, Radiant City was driving people insane. <laughs> um, it, it was it was something. And so when we talk about building, though. Um, one of the big changes in architecture and design we've seen, as you mentioned, is the computer revolution, mm-hmm. which allows a much more, we'll say, imaginative take on what, what buildings are supposed to be. At the same time, that almost demands that they're going to be fashionable or somehow built in a mm-hmm. way that, that, you know, and not that that's what you're proposing, but that's uh, the trend in architecture yeah. is for these, these trendy buildings. Mm-hmm. How... How do you build for flexibility, I guess? I mean, you, you talk about building for the important human design interaction and such. Mm-hmm. How do you build to ensure that, you know, well, we sort of figured out some other aspects of, of you know, how this works. How to keep a building, I guess, from being frozen in a certain mm-hmm. way when mm-hmm. it comes to, to being able to, to help people. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the interesting thing about the technologies that architects are, are correctly excited about now is that they have advanced far enough that you can apply the principle of mass customization to buildings. And so you actually can, whereas the earlier modernists couldn't do that because they had mass-produced materials and they needed to use them in the ways that they did, now it's either almost as inexpensive or as inexpensive to mass customize building parts. So they really can be inflected much more to what I call feet on the ground experiential design. Mm -hmm. Um, So that is a very exciting part of of the trends that are going on. Now you have to remind me of the question again because that was only one part. How do you build for that flexibility in terms of, well, we just sort of discovered a new principle about, you know, Mm -hmm. our cognition and the environment. Okay, Uh, so so that's one part of the answer. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the answer is that you use the tools of the environment to to enrich and make that environment more flexible. Take natural light. Natural light changes all day long. Um, now, this is, it doesn't speak so much to the, to the flexibility part of it in terms of flexibility of use, but it does speak to the, the 
the sense that these environments can anchor you in place and also give you and and constantly change in a way that stimulates you. Um, uh, because if you do a building that does natural light in a really intelligent way, it's going to change all the time. I think you mentioned in the book the uh, regulations in China, or at least in some Chinese yes. cities, to make sure there's natural X amount light. of light every day that, that's coming in. On the shortest day of the year, oh, two right. hours of sunlight on the shortest day of the year in the bottom floor yeah. of Unless, an apartment, of course, of smog is all the way down and, and well, blocking yes, everything. Well, yes, that's but a different <laughs> problem. <laughs> I have very little China experience. I had a Shanghai trip, and that was uh-huh. a, well, that was illuminating in its its way. In fact, that was um, I was standing on the Bund, looking across the the yeah. water at this massive skyline, and was told by the people I was traveling with that that didn't exist 15 years ago. That they basically built like the entire Manhattan skyline in in that isn't it span amazing? Of time. It's Along incredible. Along with digging, I think 12 subway lines during right. that. That's which if you don't care about. Uh, ownership of private property, you can sort of do like that. <laughs> that's true. That's a good point. So what's home for you? Uh, right here. Yeah. Um, in the book, you mentioned your, your childhood in Princeton and uh-huh. what the house once meant. But, you know. Right. Uh, I grew up, basically I grew up simultaneously in that house in Princeton and in Vermont uh, because we always had a house in Vermont. My father came from Vermont. Yeah. And... Since he we were he worked on a professor's schedule, uh, he had a lot of time off. And the minute he was finished teaching, we would get in the car and we would go north. Yeah. And um, so I have both the house in Princeton was beautifully designed and a really wonderful place to be, and I have the landscape of Vermont in me too. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've got this converted church right, in Harlem, That's, which uh, has the you know, I mean in a way it's sort of synthesizes both because yeah. it's beautifully designed, um, but it has natural light streaming in all day long. Things change. There are moments when I, the sun will hit the window in a certain way, and I'll go, oh, i got to wash that window, <laughs> 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 and so on. And, and because there's so much natural light, I can grow a lot of plants in yeah. here and things like that. Yeah, so. how, did you, how did you find the place? I, I guess because I've mentioned this place to people individually, not not actually on the show, but mm-hmm. now people will finally know that the Gold Hagens live in this absolutely wonderful, wonderful home. Um, what it, was the story? It had been sitting. Well, we used to live in the Boston area. Mm-hmm. We only moved here four years ago, and um, it was all sort of a decision that happened quite quickly. And so suddenly, we needed to find a place to live, and we need to find a school for our kid, and all this stuff at once. And we looked at condominium after condominium, apartment after apartment, co-op after co-op. And and then my husband, one night, just sort of put in to the search engine the things that we were looking for, and up came this place. And it had been on the market for months and months, not only that, it had been taken off the market. The guy had been trying to sell it for years, like yep. two or three years. Why didn't people want to buy it? Because it was in East Harlem. And East Harlem is a community that has associations with lots of bad things, including yep. crime. People told us we were nuts to move here. But Danny actually ran the crime statistics, <laughs> being a stats guy and a political scientist. And he did research on what was the crime rates for the big bad, the big bad crimes, you yeah. know, homicide, things like that, uh, on the Upper East Side in 1990? What were the crime rates on the Upper East Side in 2000? And, and then compared them to East Harlem, and it turned out that East Harlem today is much safer, like by many orders of magnitude, five times or something like that. I don't remember the exact figure. East Harlem is much safer today than the Upper East Side was in 2000. <laughs> so, so we thought, why why shouldn't we get a converted church to live in? <laughs> that sounds great. And as Jews, you know, there, there's no absolutely. We have a mezuzah right in front. <laughs> <laughs> What's the furthest you've gone for a building to see a building? Oh my gosh! Without being, you know, I was there for uh, uh, <clears throat> to speak at an event. Oh and no, therefore. China. I mean, in order yeah. to do the research for this trip, yeah. one of the things that I realized early on was that I hadn't spent. I'd been to India, but I hadn't spent any time in other parts of Asia, mm-hmm. 
And that's where there's all this development going on. I mean, yeah. China being the, the obvious example. And, um, and that's where these mega cities are developing these, you know. Yeah, how, how inconceivable is the scale of that? To you, I mean, just the idea that we're we're going to put down a city because we expect to have five million people here in the next ten years. Um, I, it's not inconceivable yeah. now that I've seen it. Right. Um, so I, going in, just the going in, it yeah. was like I, I couldn't even. I mean, that's why I needed to go because yeah. I'm a very concrete thinker. That's part of the reason I write about concrete things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I needed to see this. And so we went to, we took a trip and we went to Seoul and Tokyo and Beijing and Shanghai for three weeks. And I just looked every day. We had architects taking us around. It was fascinating. Favorite place? Throughout. Favorite place ever? A uh, favorite place that you hit for the book and then uh -huh. your other favorite, favorite, architecturally at least, or environmentally. Well, I do have a soft spot in my heart for Khan's architecture yeah. and the Salk Institute, mm -hmm. um, which I do write about in yeah. the book. The love for that shows up on, on the uh, page. I mean, he he is just he he intuited so many of the principles that just work, and that's why people love these buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so. There are several Khan buildings that I love, not just the Salk Institute. The parliament in Dhaka in Bangladesh is just an absolutely extraordinary place yeah. uh, and a place that you can walk into every day and find new things. Um, so those are, those are some of my favorite things. Yeah. Um, and for the sake of the book, that was the, uh, also the, the, the favorites? I assume, you know, well, Salk no, was Well, no, I mean, it, for the sake of the book... Uh, certainly Khan's work is in there because I, t I do write about the Salk Institute, but there are other, you know, I have lots of favorite things, actually. Yeah. I mean, I'm writing right now about a little daycare center that was made entirely out of recycled materials in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Um, that it's, it's just this unbelievable space. It's like this one, yeah. one room thing in one of these slums. And the architect collected all these green bottles and made an entire wall yeah. um, by embedding the bottles into the wall. So the light changes all the time, every day. And, he, and the wood he used was harvested from wooden pallets and so on. So that's that's my current favorite thing, actually. Is I love that place. But, you know, Marlon Blackwell's church. I mean, I have a lot of favorite things. Cool. The um, I know the book's just coming out this week. Mm -hmm. Well, what's next? What are you working on? And I know you're working on something because you seem like the sort of person who has... I do tend to work. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. But I'm in the unusual position right now that I actually don't know. Yeah. Um, but in the sense that I have 10 ideas and I don't know which one of them is going gonna, is gonna to beat out the other nine. Mm -hmm. uh, we are taking our son at the end of this year... Um, out of school and traveling around the world for a year, uh, an entire year. And we'll go to lots of places I've never been and oh, some I'll places I've been before. <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. Um, what prompted the, uh, the this whole thing? is something that we've been fantasizing about doing for a long time. Yeah. And, um, our son will be 17 and it's kind of the last minute to do it yeah. if you're going to do it. So, uh, so I am going to, I'm certainly going to write a lot about this trip and the things we see and where we go, whether it's going to be more memoiristic or more dispatches from different places or, or I, I don't, I, that's yeah. what I haven't figured out yet. Um, without giving away the whole itinerary, what are you focusing on? I mean, for the, the trip itself, uh, are there areas that we really need to make sure we go here? Well, we spend a lot of time in India because I was in India before, and, and it's just such a rich and incredible culture and, and built environment and in every other way. But we also spend a lot of time in China and a lot of time in Japan. Um, and that's good for Dan especially because he'll be away from people who are going to make anti-Semitic comments. So that's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> This is a callback to completely. To, yeah, okay. yes. 
And then, and then a lot of landscapes. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll go to Africa. Um, anyway, there's, it, it's pretty much the full spectrum of experiences. That sounds fantastic. And I'm, of course, immensely jealous. So um, <laughs> I do have to ask, uh, the one thing that, that gave me nightmares from the book. Um, oh, dear. The image of the two homunculi. Uh, oh, yes. For sensory and motor, uh-huh. motor selves. Uh, did, you, did you really have to go searching for the creepiest pictures possible for <laughs> what human representation is like of our own? Uh, Actually, system? most of the pictures I found of them were pretty creepy. Uh, but the homunculi are very important because they show how they show from the inside out how people really experience environments. And they're these distorted figures with huge hands and um, one of them has this enormous tongue and huge ears, and then the body is this tiny little toothpicky kind of thing. <laughs> Which, again, just had nightmares about yeah, afterwards. No, but, but they're, that, <laughs> they're a little monstrous, I agree. <laughs> but they're us inside. So. Uh-huh, exactly. What's the biggest thing you learned? I mean, I know the, the whole cognitive neuroscience curve, like you it said, but uh-huh. what, was, what was your moment? That's a good question. Um, I know you went into it understanding, at least intuitively, that the environment, the built environment, mm-hmm. matters, matters. But I guess I learned so many things. Uh, but one of them comes from the process of writing the book. After having spent all those years mm-hmm. reading these studies and really learning how human cognition and sensory perception work and what some of the com- complexities of that are and um, and so on, was how to write that in a way that people could really, that could grab people, could interest them, and could make them understand its mm-hmm. importance. And that um, that meant really concretizing um, these ideas that I had in the context of looking at specific landscapes, buildings, places, streetscapes, and so on. Um, So earlier drafts had a lot more, had, had a lot, were packed with nuance Mm -hmm. and information. And slowly I learned that we don't, we didn't need all of that nuance, not to make the points that I was trying to make. So it's partly something that comes from my academic background um, and then moving into this kind of book. But it's a product that I'm incredibly proud of, and I think I think we got the balance right. I think I, we did it. I would agree. Uh, the last question, which I derailed you from earlier, what would you change about New York from an urban planning, design, architecture kind of way? Um, well, a lot of the problems that New York has can't be fixed yeah. uh, because there's too much in the way right now. Look, I think the kinds of things that Bloomberg was doing when he was mayor are the right kinds of things. You know, making streets narrower, um, putting in public plazas in unexpected places that really work and attract people and make them feel comfortable there. Um, regulating the, they actually, the design standards for the buildings that um, that were approved went up to some extent because uh, we had people in the city planning department who did very rigorous reviews. Uh, so planting a lot of trees in the city, trying to carve out open spaces for parks and so on wherever they could. Um, these are things that Bloomberg realized were really important and are really important. Um, what else would I change? I'd change the East Midtown plan. I mean, look, there's so much is so much of what's being developed. I'd change Hudson Yards for sure. Um, so much of what's so being you could developed. Put a, a giant is, football stadium, right? Uh, I'm no, just kidding. no. <laughs> <laughs> that I was mean, one of my happiest moments of. Having read The Power Broker uh-huh. and then uh, seeing Shelley Silver blow up the the whole football stadium right. thing because of the incredibly Byzantine uh, committees and rule uh-huh. structure between the city and Albany that nobody had gotten all the way to the bottom of before they realized, oh, my God, Shelley's the guy who can control whether this happens or right. not. It does yeah. come down to 
to individual people making individual decisions. Yeah. It really does. Hence him getting indicted years later. Yes, right. <laughs> into prison. Yep. <laughs> anyway, that's New York. Yep. Sarah Goldhagen, thanks so much for coming on the Virtual Memories Show. Oh, it was a great pleasure and really fun talking to you, Gil. And that was Sarah Williams Goldhagen. Her new book, Welcome to Your World, from Harper Publishing, is an amazing piece of work. Um, if you're listening to this in real time, it comes out today, which is April 11th, 2017. So get it at your favorite bookstore. Learn more about the environments you experience every day and how they can be improved and, and what you should be asking for as a, um, I'll say citizen instead of consumer, um, because I think we kind of get away from that. You should also check out Sarah's website, sarahwilliamsgoldhagen.com. Uh, you can find more of her writing there, as well as archives of her great architectural criticism, which is where the Santiago Calatrava stuff we talk about during the show initially came up. You also find out about appearances she's doing for the book and other media besides this podcast. Uh, the website is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, Goldhagen. G-O-L-D-H-A-G-E-N dot com. Now, once we wrap the main session, I asked Sarah, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear her answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our monthly podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, patron-only blog, and the handwritten show notes for every episode. We also just got the transcript in for the first ebook. I need to sit down and, and go through that, edit it, figure out how to convert it into a good ebook format, and then how we're going to distribute it. But that's something that um, you guys are helping support and um, that I really want to offer up for you. So go to patreon.com slash VMS pod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, this one was recorded at Sarah's amazing home in East Harlem. Uh, that involved a toll on the George Washington Bridge, uh, $16 for parking and then gas and time. Now, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, tolls, equipment, coffee, uh, then visit patreon.com slash VMS pod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. The special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters up at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David still has a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, I believe. You can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with return guest Wallace Wilde Manozzi. Or so I hope. Um... I mean, we haven't recorded yet, so she's pretty reliable. I think it's going to happen. I am so sorry to put you in a bind like this. I'm, you know, I know you guys kind of hinge your plans for the week on who I'm going to have lined up for next week. Um, I think in another week or so, I'll be back up with a few episodes recorded in advance. It's just uh, because of the way certain things have fallen, like, um, my life. Um, I've kind of fallen behind and have to record the weekend of the show. So deal with it. Um, thank me for being so devoted. Maybe kick in a couple of shekels over at Patreon. Anyway, until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. Or you can visit soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find a lot of recent episodes by going to YouTube and searching for Virtual Memories. I Basically, the show uh, uploads there, too. It's just a still image and the audio from the uh, the, the show. But a lot of people seem to like checking out podcasts that way. So, 
You can do any of those those ways you like. You can find our RSS feed on either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com, and subscribe that way. And you can get on our email list through either of those sites. And the emails turned out to be a lot more entertaining nowadays. I don't really write about um, this week's show so much as uh, engage in a little Montaigne-esque reverie. Um, if you're into that sort of thing, go to vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm and sign up. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Virtual Memories Show, and at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, do me a favor. Go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show in the store, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll show Apple that we actually have listeners who care, not just people who download because they subscribed once upon a time, and That'll help us build a bigger audience. They'll start featuring it or connecting it to other shows uh, relatively related to it. And, um, you know, you'll suddenly become one of those guys who knew about the show before anybody else did. Anyway, until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Ra, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs>